podcast in a series of speakers about serpentine, which is a topic that our Wildflower Show Committee decided to feature because um, serpentine flora is very important to the California flora. It's a, a, a big part of its diversity. And uh, we have good examples of serpentine right nearby. We're in a good corner of the state to be able to find it. And it's something that um, myself included, we talk about pretty casually, oh, it's serpentine, so it must be Jeffrey Pine. But what exactly does that mean? And um, what, how, why is Jeffrey Pine there and not other places? Well, it is other places, but um, you know, how do the plants react to it? So we had four speakers during our wildflower show and um, we recorded all of their lectures and they're on our website under the education tab where you go to the archive programs and you click on the YouTube link and there you'll find them. And there's uh, Mark Bailey first talked about the geology because he's, he's a geologist, a real geologist. So we learned things like serpent, serp, even serpentinite is a group of 20 different minerals. Nothing simple in the rock world. There's all those different, um, all those different elements that can be combined in different ways. And he talked about um, how the, the creation of serpentine has, is, is part of those continental shelves, uh, co continental plates drifting around and crashing into each other. And then um, Nishi Raja Karuna from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo talked about um, serpentine from different places around the world. We're not the only people who have it. In fact, most of the long coastlines in the world have a string of serpentine along them. So we saw pictures of serpentine places from South Africa and New Caledonia and Sri Lanka and other places as well. And that was pretty exciting. And then we had um, Dana York showed a lot of pictures of uh, flowers from Mount Eddy, which is a big chunk of serpentine. And finally, John McRae from Six Rivers National Forest showed us plants from four of the botanical areas that Six Rivers has. One of which we're going to on our field trip this coming weekend. Okay. so. Actually, before I pulled all that together, I had signed up Christy to talk about something about serpentine. She had something else in mind, but she mentioned she could talk about serpentine. So I pounced and said, that's what we want to hear about. And um, I first heard about Christy just in my role as president of our chapters. You know, every once in a while, there was some topic that I'd write to somebody in our neighbors up there in Oregon, the Native Plant Society of Oregon in the Siskiyou chapter, which is headquartered in Ashland. And there's this very noticeable email address that would pop up. It was called, and the email address was coprolitemergi at something or other. Well, I know what a coprolite is and I'll let Christy tell you what it is. But th that was a very distinctive email address. And I thought, hmm, that must be an interesting person. And uh, when I was starting to think about speakers, I think, uh, I think uh, Michael Kaufman mentioned that Christy could give a good talk. Anyhow, she came with some recommendation that I valued. And so I, I wrote to Christy and she did agree to do, give us a talk. And um, besides being a good botanist who knows a lot of geology, she's also the stewardship director of Southern Oregon Land Conservancy. And I'll let her tell you what that means. And I hope we learn a little bit about her conservancy, who's having a party in that same building where she's shut in a dark room giving this talk. <laughs> um, okay, and, and she, has, she has been very active with the Siskiyou chapter of the Native Plant Society of Oregon for a long time. So um, I'm, ha I'm happy and excited to welcome Christy to speak to us on serpentine ecology. Wacky soils build glorious places. 
It's all yours, Christy. Well, thank you. And I guess let's we'll ask people to put their questions in the chat and we'll deal with them at the end. Well, I'm so happy to be here. And Michael Kaufman from your chapter has graciously talked to our chapter, the Siski chapter, numerous times. So we thought it was time to send one of our geeks your, your way. Um, and coprolite, by the way, is a wonderful world, word that describes fossilized poop. <laughs> so uh, kudos to those who recognize that word. So this talk I'm giving was developed a few years ago. Um, for a number of years, I taught the serpentine ecology section of the Klamath uh, Siskiyou bioregion training for the Oregon master naturalist. And the training was about five days in the Klamath Siskiyous based at Siskiyou Field Institute um, in Selma, Oregon, in Southwest Oregon. And we would wander to one location to another. And over there is a rare endemic serpentine plant. And over there, and over there, and this little jewel here. and had great fun. Um, and I wish we could all be out in the field together because it's a lot more fun than Zooms. Um, but uh, a few years after that, I was asked to give a talk at a conference. And this talk more or less kind of summarizes some key points within serpentine ecology. So a little background on what that means, a little bit of geology, and a couple peaks at special serpentine locations and serpentine plants in Southwest Oregon. So that's where we're headed, but thanks for joining us. Okay, this is the origin of session story. I was a young mother uh, taking classes at Portland State University and I took a geology of Oregon class. In fact, I managed to accumulate a minors plus of geology classes in my uh, schooling. Um, and I heard about these serpentine rocks, these mantle rocks, which you don't find in Portland, Oregon. Um, so I dragged my beautiful little child to, and we drove to Brookings, Oregon and drove and drove and drove on gravel roads. And we got to the western edge of the Kalamiopsis wilderness and went to this very magical place called Vulcan Lake. All of, it was my son's first backpack trip. And I found the landscape staggeringly beautiful, austere. Um, I think Pokey and Gumby had a good time too. <laughs> and I fell in love with the red rocks and the special plants. And there is something magical and maybe a little spooky about some of these landscapes, especially when there's a lot of rock. Um, and I think this picture of my child summarizes that spookiness. There he is in front of some cobra lily looking like an anemic vampire child, which he was not. <laughs> he grew up just fine. But that's where my obsession be um, began and that was over 20 years ago. And um, so it's a great place um, to bring my interest in botany and geology together and beautiful locations. So the first couple slides are kind of overview slides of why I think you should even care. This is the top of one of my favorite places. My favorite place in Oregon is called Big Red Mountain. And there's a number of red mountains in Western North America that are also serpentine or mantle rock. But this one's on the Siskiyou Crest and not too far, far from the town of Ashland. It's on this road 20, this high elevation road that goes from Mount Ashland to Dutchman Peak um, and goes through different mountains with different geology and different rare plants. But here's the thing, the top of this mountain, which is about 65,000 feet elevation is mantle rock. So what's astonishing to me is you take rocks that originate from the earth innards five, seven, 50 kilometers deep into the earth. And somewhat magically through natural processes can have them up high up in the mountains exposed to the atmosphere. So unlike where they were once originated. 
mantle rocks, serpentine rocks are rare on the earth and where they grow, where they, where they exist, we have very special plants. About 1% of the terrestrial land on planet earth is serpentine or this mantle rock. Okay, another thing that's really important is, so these rare rocks have low nutrients and heavy metals that most of our terrestrial plants are not adapted for. And they grow very special endemic plants that grow nowhere else but on serpentine, usually. Um, they're little jewels. And wherever you go in the world where there are serpentine outcrops, generally there's at least a few endemics. And I would love to have the field trip where I went all around the world and visited all of these endemics, but it's probably not gonna happen, maybe a few places. But some of the endemics, rare plants are really broadly endemic and grow on serpentine. So for instance, there's a beautiful rock fern called lemon sword fern. If you've met it, maybe you can raise your little paddle. Um, it's a gorgeous fern. And it's pretty common on serpentine outcrops where you find them in Western North America, in California, in Washington, even into British Columbia. And then there's really, really narrow serpentine endemics, like the Tiburon jewel flower that grows on an outcrop just across from uh, the Golden Gate Bridge uh, on the Tiburon Peninsula. The Klamath siskiyous are special in so many ways, as you know, in that we have the biggest hunks of these mantle rocks in North America. Um, and about 70% of the endemic species that only grow on the Klamasiskus are serpentine endemics. And they're all fabulous. Um, however, these endemics only are growing on about 3% of the land in the Klamasiskus. Okay, and that's one point. Another one. The great thing, if you're a conservationist or a botanist um, or a lover of natural habitats, is serpentine, because of these specialized soils, are somewhat resistant, are pretty resistant to invasion by non-native plants and noxious weeds. So in Southwest Oregon, and I also know in California, a lot of our lower elevation, elevation grasslands have been transformed overall from bunch grass communities uh, to non-native annual grasses. You can go to serpentine at low elevations and look at all those bunch grasses and pretty flowers in between. And so if you're a land manager and you have a preserve that's on serpentine, usually noxious weeds are not your biggest concern, although that might be changing a little bit. Um, some of the uh, serpentine grasslands around San Francisco are being invaded by non-native grasses, unfortunately, and it's linked to both nitrogen pollution and climate change. So, um, however, it's still a very amazing trend that I appreciate. And uh, I bet some of you also, your little heart patters when you see bunch grasses, especially at low elevations. I love them. Okay, and the other big picture thing about serpentine is, is that a clear cut? No. <laughs> Often in uh, Western North America, it is a, a clear cut, but serpentine soils often have really abrupt boundaries. Usually our vegetation communities that kind of gradually go from forest to woodland to chaparral. Serpentine often, it, that's where the serpentine rocks are, that's where the soils are, different vegetation. Um, and I think it's just a super fun attribute of serpentine. Okay, definitions, oh boy. So serpentine is the catch-all name that many of us use to describe these rocks derived from the mantle. So they include the rock serpentinite um, and um, many other um, kinds of rocks, but serpentine is just the catch-all. So we can confuse each other with that. The actual state rock of California is serpentinite the rock, um, but it's made up of a number, as Carol said, of serpentine minerals. Um, but we still can also just call it serpentine. Um, serpentine rocks are ultra mafic, which means that their mantle rocks 
very high, over 80% uh, composition of magnesium and iron. Um, one of the general terms for ultramafic or ultramafic rocks is peridotite. That's a very common rock type. Um, it's an igneous rock. It comes from magma. But when it is brought up close to the surface and altered through metamorphism, it turns into a rock called serpentinite, or we can call it serpentine. So use whatever term you want to, but just know that there's a little nuance there. And um, apparently, in some publications, the serpentine minerals are called serpentinite to add to the confusion, but just don't worry about it. Um, wacky soils is a term uh, created by a botanist, a very celebrated botanist, uh, no longer with us, from University of Berkeley. And he was describing very special soils that are challenging for plants, but also create endemics. So serpentine is a classic wacky soil, um, but gypsum, sand dunes, mine tailings, vernal pools, places of bat guano, those are also wacky soils. Um, and serpentine ecology is like all of the above, the biotic, the geologic, the physical processes. Okay, definition page. This is not a good map, <laughs> but we're gonna look at it anyway. Um, and um, essentially, these are where you find serpentine or mantle rocks throughout the world. And they tend to run in belts. Um, the hottest spots for big chunks of mount of rock are places like Cuba and New Caledonia, but also like the Philippines and Indonesia, kind of the second tier of really big outcrops of ultramafic rocks or serpentine are California and the Klamath Siskiyous, the Baltics, Turkey, Japan, all places that I think many of us would like to visit. Um, where you find serpentine rocks, again, only 1% of land is serpentine, represents either historical um, plate margins or current active plate margins. So for instance, in New York, there's serpentine, but currently there's no subduction, there's no volcanoes, there's no spreading centers, but it represents a time when the Appalachians were an active continental interaction place with, with the plates. And we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, these maps probably don't even matter to people who look at county maps in Oregon, but this is kind of my turf, the land that I'm most familiar with. And the map on the right is Jackson County, which includes Medford and Ashland. And the left is uh, the marvelous Josephine County um, with Cave Junction and Selma and Grants Pass. Uh, the brown bits are serpentine. So I actually live in Talent, Oregon, and I can drive for about an hour over 20 miles on gravel roads to Big Red Mountain, to um, Observation Peak, to Dutchman Peak, and visit some serpentine. I also can go to the far northwest corner of uh, the county, Evans Creek drainage, right kind of at the Rogue Umpqua Divide, and find a few little patches. But if I really need some serious serpentine and endemics, go over to Josephine County, go to the Illinois Valley, and that's where the Josephine Ophelioite is. Um, anyway. All right, so here is stuff that is great if you have a background in geology and sometimes gets a little confusing if you don't have a couple classes. But the Earth, our beautiful planet, has a crust. It's mostly made of mantle and it has an iron core, right? And we know that the crust is broken into pieces that throughout the planet's history have built ocean basins, have built continents, have moved continents down to the South Pole like Antarctica and gobbled up oceans and continents and reconfigured them. Um, and that is very dynamic and exciting. And that's why we have serpentine on the Earth's surface. These plates uh, float more or less on the asthenosphere, which is essentially an area that's not like a mantle lake or a magma lake. It's apparently the viscosity more of piano wire, but they move and interact on the asthenosphere. Anyway, big picture, our plates on the very top part of the Earth's surface move about. And 
they can move apart and build new, new land at spreading centers, and then they can converge upon each other. So on the right, we have a subducting oceanic plate, which is heavy, mostly basalt, going underneath and diving under the much lighter granitic continental crust. And that is the environment where generally you magically to me, uh, maybe not magic to a geologist, um, can get serpentine from the mantle up on the Earth's surface. Often the environment is you have an island arc like the Philippines or Japan or Indonesia coming in on the oceanic plate towards the continent. The island gets stuck and the island gets attached to the continent as well as chunks of ocean crust. All right, enough of that. Um, these chunks of oceanic crust or lithosphere um, are called ophelialites. And there's a few places in the world where you can find the whole sequence of oceanic crust going 7, 10, 15, 20, 30 kilometers deep up on the surface of the earth. Um, apparently a great place to see it is Cyprus. Um, there's uh, some other locations too, like in Papua New Guinea a place that's pretty decent to see a lot of these different rocks associated with these ocean crustal pieces is the Smith River and also the Berryessa region. Um, briefly though, I'll just talk about it and then we'll get into the plant stuff. Um, so usually at the top of these oceanic crusts or lithospheres, there's signs of critters. There's chert and limestone, which used to be critters that were floating around in the ocean. On top of that are the, I think, very exciting pillow basalts, which um, occur when you have uh, lava, basaltic lava hitting the ocean, these little round boulders. And then there's a sheeted dike complex, which, which represents spreading centers further out in the ocean. And these dikes represent the former necks of essentially volcanic eruptions, where rock is coming up from the Earth's mantle. We have this, of course, out in the Pacific Ocean uh, to the west of us. And then there's other rocks, and then it's mantle rock, mantle rock, mantle rock, mantle rock. Anyway, parts of these sequences, when we find serpentine on land, uh, can be present besides the beautiful serpentine rocks. I'm going to skip this because I did a lot of trail work in the sunlight today. <laughs> Um, and uh, I think, I don't know if it's going to particularly help our discussion, but do know that serpentine ultramafic rocks are, are very high in magnesium and iron and very different than granite rocks, which are um, much different. Okay, but here are the glorious rocks. At the top, we have peridotite, and at the bottom, we have serpentinite, closely related very sim similar uh, chemically, different structurally. So at the top, the peridotite often, because of the iron, has a weathered crest that's bright red or orange, uh, like Ronald McDonald's hair. Um, and, but if you break it open, usually the rock inside is black to dark green. Peridotite tends to be really knobby, and that is from the pyroxene minerals that don't weather out versus the olivine minerals weather up pretty quickly. Um, that is the original more or less mantle rock. Rarely do you find peridotite that isn't slightly altered by its journey from the center of the earth to the surface of the earth. Usually it's got a little bit of serpentine happening in it, but the serpentine rocks I think are so gorgeous, so lustrous, so variable. Um, and that is the metamorphic uh, rock version of mantle rocks. So essentially it's altered by adding some water with a little heat and you get these very different looking rocks. Ecologically, I think there's a little bit of research about how these different types of serpentine rocks um, impact uh, life. But one thing we do know is that when a rock is, is it's serpentine eyes, um, that those rocks seem to be really fragmented and fractured and they tend to have a lot of springs and form really great aquifers. Okay, so here is the peridotite page. Um, 
So pyritites are made mostly of olivine, a beautiful greenish mineral, and pyroxenes. And most of the pyroxene minerals are very low in calcium. There's a couple though that have a bit more calcium in them. Um, and um, the rock on the upper part, Donite, is almost all olivine, gorgeous rock, um, about 90% olivine. And then there's different kinds of pyritite, included, including what my son used to call hamburgerite. <laughs> he never quite heard it right, but Harzburgerite. And those have a little less olivine in them and a little bit more pyritite. Um, you can get um, a, really cool accessory minerals. This jack straw mineral at Big Red Mountain on the Siskiyou Crest has these beautiful like splinters of this mineral called anthophyllite, which is kind of related to the micas. Um, okay, so that's a peek at pyritites. And then serpentinite, and uh, I'm gonna have to read this quote. So one of, I think maybe this first California state geologist, this is what he said about serpentine or serpentinite. These rocks show in an infinite variety of forms. They are like Cleopatra, never stale. So, you know, I think he had a crush on Cleopatra, but serpentine rocks are extremely variable, often lustrous, often slick inside, um, often green, often black, often extremely variable. And uh, standing at, at rock outcrops um, are beautiful. The, there are a number of minerals associated with these serpentinite rocks, but the main ones are lizardite, um, antagorite, which is really platy, and the fibrous mineral chrysotile, which is one of a big group of asbestos minerals. Um, apparently in the group of asbestos minerals, this one is not as lethal to human beings, but if you're working in mining or road building, and I would even want to tell people who like off-road vehicle riding <laughs> in um, serpentine landscapes, which I wish they would not do, it, it could be a hazard. Um, but the hazard is relatively small for people like you and me who are walking around um, and the chrysotile isn't floating around in the air. All right, okay, here's the plants, yay. So um, this is a picture of one of my, well, my favorite paintbrush, split hair paintbrush. It's a little tiny purple fuzzy bugger. Um, and you find it a little bit into California in a Klamath Siskiyous. It's mostly in kind of the drier um, Siskiyous on the Eastern end. Um, but I wanted to talk about the serpentine plant challenge. And um, many of you kind of heard this recipe. Why is it so hard to grow in serpentine soils? One, the uh, nutrients are low, nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, all those things we put in our gardens are very low. And especially calcium, which plants need for cell maintenance and photosynthesis. And in particular, the calcium magnesium ratio is not good for plants. Too much magnesium, not enough calcium. Also, most serpentine soils have heavy metals in them that can be toxic to plants. So chromium, nickel, cobalt. Chromium actually isn't as big of a problem as nickel is. It's a little bit more stable in the soil. Um, a lot of these soils, but not all of them, tend to not be well developed. They tend to be rocky. They tend to not grow a lot of plant vegetation on them, especially in, the, in our temperate region. Um, so there's not a lot of biological activity, there's not a lot of decomposition. Um, they tend to be tough places to grow, but great places to grow if you're a serpentine endemic. Uh, serpentine plants tend to be smaller than uh, plants off the serpentine substrate. They tend to have xeric characteristics, really fuzzy, um, deep roots, short, um, one thing I love, many serpentine plants, at least in the Klamath Siskiyous, tend to be pretty small, but they're mostly flower, um, very pretty. Um, and um, so that's kind of part of the serpentine syndrome. Oh, and here we are. Has anybody ever met Art Kruckerberg while he was still on this earth? Actually, I can't see all of you, so I don't know if you're raising your paddles. 
Well, our Kookaburn is most certainly, was most certainly, and still is kind of the father of the, the modern study of serpentine ecology. He was going to Stanford, and then World War II occurred, and uh, for his service, he was actually sent to Japanese language school, which ended up actually really helping him talking to other botanists in Japan. And Japan, by the way, has great serpentine outcrops. Um, he eventually got his PhD from Berkeley, where he studied serpentine ecology. He moved to the University of Washington, where not only did he continue his research on kooky, kooky soils, but he also co-founded the Washington Native Plant Society and wrote a number of, a couple of books on gardening with native plants before it was super popular like it is today. Um, he did a number of elegant uh, studies and one of them that was particularly important is he grew out serpentine plants um, on different soil types and discovered that serpentine plants grow just fine off serpentine but many of them don't compete well with the plants off serpentine. Looks like he was a beautiful gentleman. So um, Kukeberg kind of made a classification of how plants respond to the special soils of serpentine. And of course, most of them don't grow on serpentine. It's too rough. Um, so many of our beautiful plants uh, don't grow on serpentine. There's a different Dowingia that also grows in the vernal pools um, around where I live. One group of plants that grow on serpentine are very interesting. There's the serpentine indicators. And often these plants primarily grow on serpentine and are associated with serpentine, but in a different part of the range, they grow off of serpentine. So Jeffrey pine is classic. It grows kind of in a belt in the Sierra Nevadas um, which definitely includes some serpentine, but much of it is granitic. However, in our region, if I see a big Jeffrey pine cone on the ground, I start looking around and thinking, oh, I must be on serpentine. You only find it on serpentine in the Klamath Siskiyous, at least the part that I'm familiar with, and or plantations planted by Forest Service um, silviculturists. Um, Cobra lily is one of those plants too. It is found a bit off of serpentine, but generally is a serpentine indicator. Um, bear grass is very common in the wet Northwest Cascades, but in our region tends to indicate that you're on serpentine. This is my favorite serpentine indicator, this Indian dream fern. Um, notice those black stipes, really important with indigenous um, basketry um, for many um, indigenous groups in Western North America. Um, but this one, when I, years and years, I was a rare plant botanist walking mostly in Oregon, but also in California. When I saw this fern, I paid special attention. I went, oh, I'm in serpentine. This one is pre pretty cosmopolitan on serpentine. Okay, and then there are the species that grow on and off serpentine. Um, Kruckeberg like to call them the Bundenbog species, the soil wanderers. However, there's distinct races. For instance, uh, Western Azalea, the, the, the race that grows on serpentine physiologically is different, but not in form than the azaleas that grow off of serpentine. For instance, the serpentine azaleas are um, more tolerant of alkaline soils and higher magnesium levels. And uh, if we had time, or maybe we had uh, evolution, uh, evolutionary biologists, um, questions about evolution and special soils like serpentine are terribly interesting. And then we have the serpentine endemics. Um, only found on serpentine. This is one that I particularly like that is common, well, not common. It's known in a few locations on the Siskiyou Crest and a little bit into California, Epilobium Siskiyouans. Many of them are just absolutely gorgeous. Um, the fern in the very back is lemon sword fern, um, major serpentine indicator plant. The endemics come in different flavors. Um, 
Many of you are probably familiar with the paleoendemics. These are species <laughs> that once were under different climate in North America, much, much, much more common than they are today. And now you find them in the mountains of the Klamath Siskiyous, particularly the Western Klamath Siskiyous where there's more precipitation than where I live in the Ashland section of the Klamath Siskiyous. So the shaggy iconic burr spruce and the wonderful shrubby saddler oak. And then there's this group of marvelous, very clever plants, or at least they've evolved great strategies um, that deal with the heavy metals. Most plants that grow in serpentine exclude nickel into their plant body, but there are a few plants that bring it into their plant body and they hyperaccumulate it. Usually it, they put the nickel in a part of their plant body that's not all that important. So for instance, the Siskiyou of which there's three, uh, I don't remember if they're varieties or subspecies now, but all three of them um, hyperaccumulate nickel. And one of them can hyperaccumulate it to the level of 3% of its dry weight is nickel, but they store their nickel bits um, next in the cells, the accessory cells, right next to the guard cells. And the guard cells are the cells that open up the stomates to let oxygen, you know, air exchange, carbon dioxide and oxygen. Um, another one found um, that hyperaccumulates nickel in Oregon and a little bit into California is this cuneate viola or viola cuneata, beautiful little violet, pretty common in the Illinois Valley on Jeffrey Pine Savannah. Um, however, not too many species are known that hyperaccumulate nickel in Western North America, but there hasn't been a lot of investigation either. Um, there's a, a beautiful group of plants, the jewel flowers, Streptanthus, that have a whole like tribe of flowers that are endemic to serpentine, but only one of them, uh, Streptanthus polygagoides, hyperaccumulates nickel. Why? Who knows? This one grows in the Sierra Nevada. Um, but if you go to older landscapes with even bigger hunks of serpentine, you can find many more species of nickel hyperaccumulators. And New Caledonia, where I really, really want to go in the Pacific, um, has 65 species, probably more since I last looked it up, of uh, species that hyperaccumulate nickel. And there's one tree that its sap is blue <laughs> because up to 25% of the latex is, is nickel. Um, there are over 900 species that are serpentine endemics, including a whole family endemic to this island, series of islands. Anyway, it would be a wonderful place to go. And apparently it's also a place of the largest skink, a kind of lizard in the world. And one other, for, anyway, uh, I would love to go. Someone I know, a friend of mine said he's gonna organize a field trip and uh, let, I'll let you guys know if we get one together and can actually afford to go um, after the pandemic. Um, but general trends in endemic plants on serpentine, um, include the size of the serpentine, the bigger hunk of serpentine you have, the more likely you will have a lot of little endemics that grow only in that location. So like New Caledonia, like Cuba, um, the wetter the landscape is, uh, you tend to have more endemic species, although there's a sweet spot with that. So for instance, like so think about Western North America, the Klamath Siskiyous are the sweet spot for having the most endemic serpentine species. You head further north with more precip, yeah, you start losing the endemics. There's just only one or two. Southern California, eh, not as many as the Klamath Siskiyous. So there's kind of a precipitation sweet spot. And then how old it is the exposed rock? So for instance, if you compared um, uh, Europe with Japan of similar temperate climate, um, Japan has many more endemics because that landscape did not have continental glaciation. So how recently exposed have those serpentine rocks been um, available to evolve uh, special kooky plants? Um, 
a subset within um, uh, hyperaccumulating heavy metals is a sort of interesting area of phytomediation uh, and bioprospecting. So some plants that hyperaccumulate heavy metal, and there are a number of them, not just nickel hyperaccumulators, um, have been used by miners to help them find where to mine. Um, but they've also been used, at least in a small scale, in restoration of mining tailings. Um, there was an experiment about 25 years ago in the Illinois Valley in Josephine County where two uh, species from Europe, one's from Turkey and one's from kind of the Eastern Europe, Elysiums, yellow tough Elysiums, were with the county commissioner, commissioner's permission planted in a number of different locations, including by the Cave Junction Airport, um, and where there's their nickel hyperaccumulators, their, their serpentine endemics to Europe, uh, their noxious weeds now, the class A noxious weeds. And it's been 25 years and we're still trying to clean them up. It's so it can be a problem as we all know when you move plants around. Another person I wanna highlight and also kind of, kind of move into a little bit more into South West Oregon is Thomas Jefferson Howe. His family, I think, uh, were from um, the Midwest and his father didn't believe in slavery. So he came to Oregon, of course, which wasn't very tolerant of black people, but wasn't a pro-slavery state. And they settled on Savi Island outside of Portland. His father was a doctor, but he wanted to raise farmers. So Thomas only had a couple months of official schooling but he and his brother taught themselves botany and would go on collecting trips throughout Oregon to the point where Hal became an expert on the floor of Oregon. And apparently his spelling wasn't so great, <laughs> but you know, honestly, late 1800s, early 1900s, I think all the spelling looks weird, <laughs> but um, he corresponded with Asa Gray and Green and all these other prominent botanists throughout North America and the United States. And he wrote the first floor of the Pacific Northwest. Um, and when he passed away, over 10,000 herbarium samples went to Oregon State University. Um, currently, there's still at least 30 species, mostly serpentine endemics that are named after him. He was, by the, this, the, by the way, the discoverer of the Brewer Spruce. And now there's a special botanical interpretive area named after T.J. Howe. It's called the T.J. Howe Botanical Tour. And if you look at this map, it mostly shows the, the uh, ultramaphic or serpentine black blobs of the Klamath Siskius. Um, note that the Josephine Ophiolite is really big, but the Trinity Ophiolite is bigger. Um, but just between Kirby and Selma in Josephine County, there's a botanical drive with kiosk and handouts that takes you through a beautiful serpentine landscape um, up this very, very scenic ride drive that includes the Illinois River. And it's named Dr. T.J. Howe, a very humble and accomplished botanist in the early 1900s in Oregon. And I think he just looks so sweet. So these are pictures from the Botanical Wayside, which is the first stop on this uh, drive. There is a boardwalk that goes to a very big, Hal Finn, very large uh, Darlingtonia wetlands at the base of Eight Dollar Mountain. You can kind of see Eight Dollar Mountain there on the left, on the upper left hand picture. Um, and Eight Dollar Mountain really is a hot spot within a hot spot of the Illinois Valley. There are at least 70, although, you know, taxonomy and um, keeps on changing, but there's about 70 species that are serpentine endemics only known in the Illinois Valley. Um, and Eight Dollar Mountain is an extra hot spot within the hot spot of the Illinois Valley. Um, one of the plants, oh, it looks like I didn't pay attention to my labeling, I'm sorry. One of the wonderful plants is Cal Calicortis howellii that is blooming in the Jeffrey Pine Savannah, usually in May. It's kind of a tall, white Calicortis. Um, next to it often is Louisia opatistis folio, um, just wonderful plants. 
This drive goes through many uh, cobra lily fins. And I bet many of you, oh, sorry, I cut off my slide there too. Many of you have heard a lot about cobra lilies, our, our iconic uh, carnivorous plant, but you're gonna hear more. <laughs> and hopefully you'll learn a few things. Um, in the clamisiskies, they grow in fins, not bogs. Fins have moving spring water and they tend to be alkaline. Um, most of them are on serpentine, which tends to have alkaline waters. Bogs tend to have water that comes from deep underground and often are associated with very acidic loving sphagnum um, mosses. Um, cobra lily fins have both the pitchers that catch the insects and also these really fabulous flowers that kind of look like alien UFOs. But this is what happens to the poor, unexpecting insects. And the story has changed a bit since the last time I checked in. The insect smells something good. <clears throat> uh oh, this would be a bad time to start coughing. Just a second, just a moment. <clears throat> Sorry, I have allergies. <clears throat> Just one moment. I promise I'll be right back. Just <clears throat> stare at the pictures. <clears throat> okay, we can converse with this darling Tonya here. Thank you. I'll just be back one minute. Okay. I have a question. Yeah. There, this big flower in the front, is that the flower of, of the cobra lily? Yes. What do you yes. know? The, ye the yellow flaps are the sepals, and the red lantern-like thing in the, inside that are the petals shaped into that lantern kind of shape. And there, there's a kind of a, there's a little bit of a space between those petals you can't see here, where the bumblebee or whatever the pollinator is can slip in to get into the stamens and pistil where the business part of the action is. Yeah, so the, the, uh, the cobra part, that's all a modified leaf. And that part, that's there all year, but it, um, the plant blooms in the spring, like now, by putting up that long stalk with the with the hanging down flower, and then uh, if the flower is pollinated and it starts making seeds, it turns and stands up. Oh, thank yes, you. a lot of a lot of lilies do that, and I bet those are pictures of the seeds in the upper left corner. Thank you for explaining that to us. Thank you, Carol. Sorry about that. I also have like That's a coffee and anxiety, so that doesn't help. Um, so the unexpecting insect smells something good on kind of the mustache of the pitcher plant, flies in, and sometimes, by the way, there's spider webs inside that cobra head, and flies to the top, and there's these fenestrations, these little windows, and it tries to get out through the windows, but it can't, and gets more and more tired, and inside the uh, tube, there are all these downward pointing hairs that eventually encourage the poor insect to fall to the bottom into the water. The water at the bottom of the pitcher is actually regulated by the plant. It's just not natural level of water. They regulate how much water is at the base with their roots. There are microbes in that water that reduce the surface tension of the water. So instead of the insect landing on the surface tension of the water, they go and drown. <laughs> and then there's seven obligate um, species found so far of mites and midges um, that live there. And they help eat <laughs> and decompose the insects, but also Darlatonias do have an enzyme at one point it was believed they didn't have any enzymes that also helped to break down the insects. But that is a story of this amazing plant. And of course, all of us who have spent time in cobra lily fence 
they do feel like sentient. There's a sentient presence with all this. Um, the fins and the clamisiscus um, not only have these great carnivorous plants, they actually often have two other species, including the, the sundew um, and the butterwort, <clears throat> but lots of rare plants. And some of them are only known in the Illinois Valley. Like for instance, the large flower rush lily, Hestingia bracteosa, of which there's actually a purple uh, variety that may or may not be a different species. Um, and what's kind of neat about the, the cobra lily fins, even on the valley floor, is they have something blooming, you know, in April and May and June into July, um, and often very, very special plants. Some of which also grow in Del Norte County in California, but some do not. Okay. Um, we know about the threats to serpentine and the rare plants. Art Kruckerberg thought the best thing to do with serpentine is to conserve it. Uh, there's challenges. There are resources like chromium and nickel. And you know, every time there's a challenge um, in our country, chromium mines, like during World War II, popped up, including at my beloved Big Red Mountain. Um, mining, off-road vehicle use. Um, in Oregon, we have a special challenge, though, and it's our land use laws. Um, Oregon, unlike California, has land use laws that have actually helped to protect intact forest land and farmland. It makes it harder to subdivide them and sell them and turn them into other things. However, serpentine, when these land use laws were created in the 1970s, was considered worthless um, by these leaders. Um, and so where there's serpentine zoning in Oregon, you can subdivide the land into five acre residential lots. And that's what people do in the Illinois Valley and Josephine County. Um, and it is a focus of my organization to try to conserve some of that land. You know, one challenge with conservation and serpentine is there's a trend to try to conserve giant landscapes. Um, however, the nature of serpentine is often, you will have little bits here and little bits there and little bits there, and each little bit might have um, rare species on it, endemic. Um, and um, so, there's a trend even with organizations like the Nature Conservancy to not focus on these little bits as much. These little bits of serpentine with rare plants, I think are unmeasurably valuable. And this is my final slide. This is a secret place that I love in a wilderness in Northern California. And I think red dogs look especially good in these mantle rock habitats. But um, this concludes my presentation, and I thank you all for, for looking like you stayed awake, and, um, and uh, I, I'm happy to take any questions. <clears throat> Kara, I can't hear you. There. Okay. Okay. So um <laughs> I'm a juicy gem. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for that. I think, I think your ending caught people by surprise. So they have they haven't thought up their questions <laughs> yet. That's okay. Have you been watching the chat? Have you seen any questions? No. Let me see, oh, let me see. I see some questions there. Oh Andrea, see, yeah. So someone wanted to know about nickel hyperaccumulation. And uh, yes, having nickel or heavy metals in your body can reduce the critters that eat you. So one additional function of that is to be less nibbled upon by herbivores. There might be other reasons we don't know yet, but that one is verified. Oh, the Santa hat, Darlingtonia. They're very, very rare. And I only know. <laughs> Live. That was one of my Christmas cards one year. Uh, oh. But thanks for noticing. <laughs>
That was one only nice watercolor I created. It was actually at a class at Siskiyou Field Institute, a watercolor class with this wonderful botanist, uh, Linda Blinken on her last name. Um, and uh, I, I, it was the one and only watercolor that I did well. Um, let me see. Um, oh, and a cover lily is the mascot of the North Coast. That's wonderful. Yeah, we have a great mascot. And uh, we have, we uh, supported and have use of the, um, the Darlingtonia artwork that's in the flora of North America. You know, the official big book that they're working on. So you sponsored it? Yeah. That's great. You know what I sponsored for the Oregon flora? Poison oak. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm like the last person that advocates for poison oak. Um, but I do want to mention though, um, next Thursday, the Siskiyou chapter, Native Plant Society of Oregon, um, for our speaker will be Dr. Linda Hardison, who runs the Oregon Flora Project. And it's a nonprofit organization associated with Oregon State University. But she will be talking about, some of you might know, we don't have the Jepson Manual, but we have two new floras um, that the Oregon Flora Project has worked on for the state of Oregon that nicely covers serpentine species. Prior to that, we, we, I always had to go to the Jepson Manual, um, actually in California. And the third volume I think is supposed to be coming out in a couple of years, but they also maintain a really excellent website. So I'm always going to Cal Flora to look stuff up, but I suggest if you didn't, haven't already used it, check out the Oregon Flora Project and you're welcome to hear about what's new with them and their website um, at our uh, meeting next Thursday. And you can find the, the link and registration on the Siskiyou Chapter Native Plant Society of Oregon Facebook page. That's worth knowing about. I, I can tell you, I, I have the first volume of the Oregon Flora and it's very useful. It's got what, ferns, conifers and monocots. But uh, it's easier to use than Jepson because it's not filled with all those desert plants that they have in the other part of California. <laughs> you know, we're up in this corner that's a lot closer related to Oregon. So you, you don't have to worry about all those plants that, that there's no chance of you seeing here. Yeah, so I really like the volume one. Oh, that's great. Um, where should we go look near Ashland for serpentinites? <clears throat> well, near Ashland, my favorite location is Big Red Mountain on the Siskiyou Crest, and you can drive there if you have a good map from Talent or Ashland, or even from the Apple Gate, but that's a long drive, um, but not until the snow melts. <clears throat> Most years, you can't really get up there until early June, um, but also from the Applegate side of Jackson County, um, you can drive up Road 20 from the other direction and visit Observation Peak, um, which is exceptional. And that landscape, like a lot of the high Siskiyous was glaciated. So not only are there special plants, but there's just gorgeous landscapes um, for lots of serpentine. Um, going to Josephine County is the way to go. And Eight Dollar Mountain, uh, um, Illinois River Road, Eight Dollar Mountain Road are great places to go um, locally to see. <coughs> Leslie has a question about um, evolving, insects evolving with uh, endemics. Um, and I probably can't answer that very well, but I can say that in terms of endemic creatures associated with serpentine, there's still a lot of work to be done, but many of the creatures are associated with endemic plants. So for instance, the leather oak, which is strongly associated with serpentine in the California coast range, has a butterfly, I think a hair streak, that its host plant is um, leather oak. Uh, the McNabb cypress also has a butterfly that it's its host plant. Um, but the story of like insect evolution and flowers and pollination ecology, I'm probably not the best person to talk about that. Uh, oh, I'm an extraordinary person. 
no. <laughs> but thank you so much. Um, thank you, Jim, very much for that. Um, um, let me see, any other questions? Oh yes, Linda Vorovic is the, uh, the artist and botanist uh, who helped me paint one nice watercolor once. Um, I took a class at the Siskiyou Field Institute um, in Selma and she led us on a tour of Eight Dollar Mountain and yeah, she's a great illustrator and a contributor to the Jepson. Yes. Yes, she's pretty remarkable and she's really fun and a little saucy. Yeah. <laughs> it's fun to be out in the field with her. Um, and she is an Arabist expert, which confused the heck out of me, um, among many oh, other things. Okay. <laughs> Let me see. Have the fires affected much of the serpentine habitat? Um, yes. Um, famously, the biscuit fire um, impacted a lot of serpentine habitat. Um, often on the Kelly Mopsis wilderness. However, these plants are pretty pre-adapted to wildfire. You know, what can be a bigger issue, and I mean, is the, the firefighting activities um, can be a problem of driving through Darlingtonia fens, of um, sometimes bringing, bringing weed seeds onto the tires, or even I, I was doing surveys in the biscuit fire scar after the fire, and I noticed that a sterile hay that had been spread to help with restoration was not sterile <laughs> and had introduced a non-native kind of pasture grass, which probably wasn't gonna do very well. Um, but overall, serpentine habitats are evolved and like fire. Um, now these more catastrophic fires that are less common, that are associated with climate change, I don't know, um, let's see. Were those the main issues? Oh, someone met um, Kukaberg. How lucky, Lisa. Yeah, Bundavag are the soil wandering species of which there's races kind of adapted to serpentine, but they also have races that are not adapted to serpentine. And morphologically, they look the same, but physiologically, they behave differently. Anything else, y'all? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to hear again um, what you know about, I get what you'd call the digestion process inside the Darlingtonia. You, you mentioned that I think seven species of mites and gnats, and then, um, so, so they're in there eating things and, and presumably pooping and um, sort of digesting things that, to a form that the, the Darlingtonia can absorb. And then you said that, that Darlingtonia also secretes its own enzymes into that liquid. Yeah, and I don't have great details about that enzyme, but I do know that like 20 years ago, when I was like wanting to do research and find out just a little bit more about Darlingtonia, it was believed they didn't have an enzyme and that all the decomposition and feeding on insects was you know natural. Um, it is natural, but there's also an enzyme besides those seven obligate species. And then again, those microbes help the whole scene too by breaking up the surface tension of the water. Um, but I bet someone else knows more about it than I do. But I think it's fascinating. Um, and if any of you, it's not a great idea to, to rip open vegetation, but if you're in an educational setting with children, or teaching a class um, or a, a field trip, opening up and looking at the bottom at the organisms, uh, the bottom of those pictures is fascinating. I do recommend doing it at least once. Is Port Orchard cedar also a serpentine indicator? I would say it's one of those species that grows on and off serpentine. Um, Lower elevations, um, I don't have as much experience with port upper cedar in California. Um, where it grows, it tends to be on serpentine, but there's montane populations like at the Oregon Caves National Monument that are off serpentine where there's big, gorgeous, wonderful trees. So I feel like it's often an indicator in the valleys, but up in montane habitats, it grows off serpentine and it's just a magnificent tree. Oh, hi, Ellen. 
Hi, thank you for asking about Southern Oregon Land Conservancy. Yes, we protect serpentine habitats. Um, that's a prior priority habitat among a few others like oak woodlands and grasslands and chaparral, which is highly underappreciated and older forests. We have some conservation easements we hold with significant serpentines on them. So they're privately owned, but we hold some of the rights that mean you can't destroy your land. You can live in your house and this is your residential area, but you need to respect your land and not develop it. Um, and some of these properties that are in the Illinois Valley where we hold conservation easements have uh, not only special status species, but also a federally endangered species, um, Cook's Lamation, that grows in two locations in Oregon. It grows in the Aga Desert in the Vernal Pole Mounded Prairie um, by Table Rocks, and the numbers are plummeting. Um, but it also grows in alluvial, vernal, serpentine influence uh, lands in the Illinois Valley. Um, and uh, is a wonderful plant. And it's doing a little bit better in the Illinois Valley other than the off-road vehicles. Um, we also are um, in the process of acquiring some preserves with ultramafic soils. Um, and we'll probably hopefully own them and care for them in, uh, next year. But thanks for asking. <clears throat> Do you, does your land conservancy operate over in the Medford area as well? Yeah, so we actually have conserved properties in five counties in Oregon, including one all the way out in Lake County by Lakeview. Um, however, we are more strategic now. We've, we're the oldest regional land trust in Oregon that started in the late 1970s. And now we focus on working in Jackson and Josephine counties. Um, so um, about half of our conserved lands are in Jackson County. Um, but in our conserved lands include some really special, special places and rare plants um, and habitat for great birds. Like Karen and I were talking about the Lewis's woodpeckers um, and we would like to conserve more lands and we're working on it. And what's your job as stewardship director? What does that mean you do? Yeah, on a good day, I, I make trails with volunteers like today or do botany surveys or pull noxious weeds. Um, uh, uh, but I also do important stuff theoretically in the office. But stewardship director, I am kind of in charge to some degree as much as one can be in terms of caring for our already concerned lands. And I have a land steward that works with me. Um, and um, we have conserved um, almost 13,000 acres of both conservation easements and fee on land. Um, and um, we do the best we can and keep on learning by great researchers about best management practices. But one nice thing about serpentine is there, other than that alyssum, there don't tend to be as much noxious weed cover um, and in many ways, they're a little easier to care for. Just let them do their thing. Does your land trust have anything to do with Table Rocks? No, other than that sometimes I lead hikes for them. So the Table Rocks are protected by conservation easements held by the Nature Conservancy. Um, Nature Conservancy owns some land, but much of the land that they purchase, they transfer to the Bureau of Land Management. Um, so we're not directly involved, but they're wonderful places to go. If you haven't botanized them, especially in the spring, they're just absolutely marvelous. Okay, um, apparently you've answered all the questions. <laughs> well, good for I, me. I kind of doubt everybody has fallen asleep. <laughs> I, um, that was really interesting, Christy. Everybody says so. And it, clearly you're in a, a great corner of the world and doing a good job there. Well, thank you and thanks for having me. Yes. And hopefully one day I'll go to one of your programs on site. 
Uh, right. I feel like I, I go to your, your area a lot, but more often during the winter, I need to go when the flowers are out. Yeah. Well, we'd, we'd like to thank you by sending you a chapter t-shirt. Yay, thank you. Okay. So um, I guess I can email you to get your, your size and your address where we can send it. It's a great gift. Thank you. And thank you for filling in during my coughing break. <laughs> I really appreciate oh, that. That was easy. You left us on a good photo. That's good. It was a good slide. Yeah. That was great. Oh, hi, okay. Thomas. Thank you. <laughs> Thomas is a caretaker of one of our conserved lands that we, we care for. <laughs> At Southern American Land Conservancy. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you, Christy. And maybe you, you so still much. have... Maybe you still have time to join that party that's happening. <laughs> at your, I hope at there's your cookies office. left over. <laughs> oh, <laughs> good. Yeah. Okay.